many young adults will experiment with drugs or alcohol at some point during their lives. Some people will drink once in a while with friends, while others like to wind down a long day with a glass of wine. Some people enjoy smoking weed with their friends, while others like to get high and watch TV and relax. For most people, marijuana and alcohol aren't that big of a deal. Most people can get a nice buzz or high and have fun with whatever they're doing. But we all know that one person who is literally unbearable to be around when they are intoxicated. Whether they drink or smoke too much and become really annoying or angry or even violent. There are people who believe that when someone does drugs and become violent, they are 100% responsible for their own actions while others believe that drugs and alcohol are to blame for certain behaviors. But no matter what you believe, it's always so tragic and so heartbreaking when someone loses their life as a result of another person's actions, whether drugs made them do it or not. But before we get into this case, I want to tell you all about the most cozy mobile game that I love to play while cuddled up on the couch after a long, tiring day. That game is Love and Pies. I've been loving this game for a few weeks now. It's the best game to play when I'm tired after a long day and I'm looking for something relaxing yet engaging and fun while cozying up in my house on a chilly night. It's also great to play while I'm traveling or waiting at the airport to pass the time. Love and Pies revolves around the heartwarming story of taking over your mother's cafe. You play as a single mom, Amelia, who has to redecorate and build a thriving business by merging ingredients to make delicious pastries while also serving your own customers. I love games where you get to create things and make your own designs, so that is why I play Love and Pies. I got to build my own cafe and design it all on my own from the ground up. Plus, when you play, you will be just blown away by Love and Pie's stunning visuals and animations. They truly create an immersive experience that makes creating your own business that much more enjoyable and engaging. New content is released every week, ensuring that the game is always fresh and engaging. You can also participate in engaging events that offer tons of rewards. Right now, they have a super cute winter-themed picnic pass as well as a new festive Christmas event for all of you holiday lovers out there. There truly is something for everyone with Love and Pies, and I'm so excited to hear how you like the game. Let's play Love and Pies together. I want to see all of the adorable cafes that you guys create. Love and Pies is free to download and is available on iOS and Android, so make sure you follow the link in my description box below to download Love and Pies. Thank you so much to Love and Pies for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, today's case is one that I know a lot of people will have totally differing opinions on, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think of this one after hearing the details. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Chad O'Malia. Chad O'Malia was born to parents Michelle Larravee and Sean O'Malia, and he was raised in Santa Clarita, California, alongside his younger brother, Shane. While Chad was born in the U.S., Chad's father, Sean, and his wife were originally from Ireland. When they moved to the U.S., the two only had each other to rely on before they went on to have Chad and his younger brother. Chad was described by his father as hardworking, dedicated, and outgoing. Growing up, he played baseball, soccer, and football, and as it turned out, football was Chad's jam. He continued playing through his days at Hart High School. As an adult, Chad was known as a fitness buff. He was someone who anybody could rely on, and he was that guy that people went to if they needed somebody to talk to. He was that guy where if he was at a social gathering and he saw someone who looked uncomfortable, he would go talk to them and try to make them feel more comfortable. I have a friend like that, and let me tell you, those are the best people to have around in your life. Chad was driven, motivated, and he wouldn't let anything get in the way of him succeeding in life. Chad was a graduate of Chico State University, and by 2018, he was working at an accounting firm in Camarillo while studying to become a CPA or a certified public accountant. Even from a very, very young age, he was somebody that was very social, like even in his toddler years. He loved being around people, and that carried through his teens, and he was the type of person that if he was at a social gathering and he saw somebody that looked or appeared to be uncomfortable, he would talk to them and try to make them feel comfortable. 
he played, he grew up playing football. You know, he was, a, he played football for Hart High School and, you know, was in the Warrior football program and, you know, loved, loved that. And I think he loved it more because of the, the group, the camaraderie, the friendships that were there. On one chance day in the spring of 2018, 26-year-old Chad was at the dog park with his dog when he happened to meet 32-year-old Bryn Spetcher. Bryn was also a bright young woman with a promising future ahead of her. She was actually born without hearing, so she had to wear hearing aids for her entire life. Being born without hearing is what really drove her to want to help others who were just like her. Bryn was originally from the Chicagoland area in Illinois, growing up in a normal middle-class family. As a young adult, she moved to Washington for college, and at the time, she had just graduated from the University of Washington with her doctorate in audiology the year prior before moving to California. She had accepted a position as an audiologist at the University of California in Los Angeles. According to her patients, she was a dedicated clinician who wanted to help others in the best way she could. But at the time, Bryn was new to the area, only having lived in California for about a year, so she didn't know too many people in that area. So, after meeting at that dog park, the two started talking more and they found that they had a good connection. So, the two started seeing each other on a more casual basis. There are some conflicting reports on the nature of their relationship, but most sources say that the two were casually dating. According to a roommate of Chad's, after meeting Bryn, she was all Chad wanted to talk about. He thought that Bryn was so amazing and he couldn't wait for his roommates to meet her. After dating for a few weeks on the evening of May 27th, 2018, Bryn went over to Chad's condo located in the Thousand Oaks area in California to hang out for a little bit. Along with her, she brought her beloved dog, who is also her service dog, a husky named Aria. I believe she had been planning to go out of town that weekend, so she wanted to see Chad before she left. At the time, Chad shared a three-bedroom condo with two roommates. That evening, Chad and Bryn hung out, sitting on the couch and watching Family Guy, which was one of Chad's favorite shows. According to his roommate, Vinny, he had gotten home at around 10.30 that night and he hung out with the two of them for a bit before he went upstairs, took a shower, and then went into his own room to lay on his bed and play around on his phone. The other roommate was also home at the time, but he was in his room and asleep. According to Vinny, that other roommate sometimes took sleeping medication and also slept with earplugs in, so he could never hear what was going on and there wasn't much that could wake him up. After that, Chad and Bryn decided to smoke some weed out of his bong. Now, Chad was described as a pretty regular weed smoker, so he obviously had a tolerance and he pretty much knew exactly how it affected him. But Bryn hadn't really smoked much in her life at all. So, the two took a couple of hits out of the bong and pretty much right away, Chad got high, but Bryn said that she didn't feel anything. This next part of the story goes differently depending on which story you choose to believe. According to some reports, after telling Chad that she didn't feel much, Chad offered to get her something more intense. After that, he filled the bong with smoke and covered the hole and then allowed Bryn to take another hit so that she could get a better inhale and feel more high. However, according to some other reports, Bryn said that she didn't feel anything and told Chad that she didn't want to take another hit, but Chad pretty much forced her to, so that is how she got too high. I do just want to pause here and say that I am not much of a smoker, but the times that I have tried it in the past, I did not know how to inhale properly, so in my opinion, if Bryn was a new smoker and hadn't smoked too many times in the past, that could be why she didn't feel anything if she just didn't get a good inhale. If she truly didn't want to take another hit, there was no way that he could have forced her to inhale the smoke. In my opinion, I think she probably did want to feel high and maybe he coached her through how to inhale properly. That is totally based on my own opinion and you may feel differently and that is okay. We will continue going throughout the video and you will learn more and be able to form your own opinions. Either way, immediately after taking that second hit, according to Bryn, she immediately started feeling really awful. According to what Bryn would later say, she took a puff of smoke and felt it in her lungs and felt like she couldn't exhale. She started to feel like she couldn't breathe. 
At that point, she felt like she was going to vomit and her vision started to go blurry. As that was happening, she started to tell Chad about how bad she was feeling. So, to help, he got her a bottle of water and was trying to talk to her and comfort her through it. She started to tell Chad that she thought she was going to die. She asked Chad to stay with her and stay awake to watch her because she felt like she was dying. So, that is what he did. But after feeling really awful for about a minute or so, she started to get angry that she was too high and started to feel like Chad wasn't high at all. At that point, she said that she started having visions and hallucinations where she thought she was dead and she felt like it was Chad's fault because he was the one who gave her the weed. I guess she started to believe that the only way to bring her back to life was to hurt Chad. She thought that killing Chad was the only way to survive. So, that is what she did. She walked over to the kitchen and grabbed an eight inch serrated kitchen knife and came back into the living room and started stabbing Chad over and over and over again. She would later say that she started hearing voices which told her to keep fighting. She said the more violent and aggressive she became, the better she felt and the more she felt like she was coming back to life. As I stated before, as this was happening, Vinny, Chad's roommate, was upstairs in his room. After the stabbing started, Vinny said that he heard some rustling noises coming from downstairs, but he didn't think much of it at first. He thought that maybe they were just playing around or wrestling or something like that. But then he started hearing someone yelling, get off of me, and then the rustling noises became louder and more intense, and he started hearing things breaking. So, he got up and decided to go downstairs and see what was going on. As he walked down the stairs, the first thing he saw were both Chad and Bryn's dog standing together on the landing area of the stairs. Vinny thought that the dogs looked really scared. He continued down the stairs and that is when he saw that there was furniture all thrown around, things were knocked over, and there was Bryn in the living room with a knife in her hand and Chad was lying there, leaned over, holding his chest, severely wounded with a hole in his heart and absolutely covered in blood. According to Vinny, when he first saw Chad, Chad said to him, Vinny, please help me. She stabbed me. While Chad said that, Bryn apparently looked at Vinny with a blank stare on her face while still holding the knife. Vinny looked at her and said, what the F are you doing? What is going on? but Bryn just continued to look at him with an empty stare. Vinny then ran upstairs and tried banging on the other roommate's door to alert him, but the roommate wouldn't wake up. Then he found his phone and called 911 as fast as he could. At that point, Vinny felt like the best thing he could do to save his friend and roommate was to get help as fast as possible. He was also afraid for his life at that point. He didn't know why Bryn was stabbing Chad or what was going on. So, he didn't want to risk trying to tackle Bryn and also being attacked, so he ran past them and towards the door to go outside and yell for a neighbor for help. But just as he was doing that, Chad had fallen to the ground and was basically limp at that point, but Bryn was not stopping her attack. She didn't seem to care that Vinny was right there. She just continued stabbing him. Vinny got out of the condo and started screaming for help, but very quickly, police did arrive and tried to save Chad. By the time police arrived, Vinny described that he was crying and hysterical before he went into a state of shock. Once police arrived, he didn't remember anything else that happened in that condo. All he remembered was that after police arrived, he could hear tasers going off, most likely in an attempt to stop Bryn from attacking Chad. According to the officers who first arrived on scene, when they got inside, Bryn was kneeling over Chad's lifeless body, still holding the knife. At first, officers thought that they were going to have to shoot her to get her to stop stabbing him. But when officers yelled for her to stop, she turned the knife on herself and started slashing and cutting at her own neck repeatedly. This caused them to change course to a less lethal way of stopping her. Police deployed their stun gun on her two times, but she resisted and continued stabbing herself. So police then used their baton to hit her arm multiple times and try to get the knife out of her hand. It was reported that it took nine blows with the baton to get that knife out of her hand. During the attack, Bryn also stabbed her beloved dog, Aria, who again was also her service dog. 
During all of this, there was also actually a neighbor who heard the entire thing. The neighbor said that she heard the sounds of a female screaming two times at around 1 a.m. on May 28th, now Memorial Day. She said that by the time she left her unit to see what was going on, police had already shown up. Out of curiosity, as neighbors do, she came out to see what was going on, and at that time, she heard the police officers using their tasers with the woman inside screaming at them to get the F out. After that, the neighbor saw police carrying the husky out of the house. She was wrapped in a blanket, and I did see in a few sources that the dog survived and did recover from being injured. Unfortunately, however, by the time police arrived, which was actually pretty quickly after they were called, Chad had already been deceased at the scene. Upon later autopsy, the medical examiner determined that Chad had been stabbed a total of 108 times to his throat, his chest, and the back of his head with two of those stab wounds perforating his heart. The stab wounds were all of varying depth with some being very shallow and some being very deep and some of those stab wounds were the result of him trying to defend himself. He died as a result of injuries to his trachea, internal jugular vein, carotid artery, lungs, heart, and his liver. But of course, Bryn was still alive, so she was taken to the hospital by the police where she immediately went in for surgery. She had suffered from several self-inflicted stab wounds, like I said, but she also had a broken arm as the result of those officers smacking her with the baton so many times. After surgery, she had her blood taken for testing and she was intubated. Upon testing her blood, it was discovered that THC was the only substance found in her system. So, she had not taken any other drugs that day other than the weed. By the time she got to the hospital, of course, the amount of weed in her system could have been lower than what she originally smoked, so there wasn't really a good way to determine just how much she had consumed. Either way, when the police first got to the hospital for questioning, they weren't able to speak with Bryn because she was intubated and on a ventilator, and she didn't have her hearing aids in at the time, so she also wasn't able to hear. But while she was still intubated, apparently she was writing on paper to communicate and in one note she wrote, he forced me to take a second hit. That's what's been reported. It probably was in response to a question that police or someone else asked, but it was just reported that she wrote that on a piece of paper. I don't know if it was spontaneous or if she was asked, but she did write that at one point. Now, after waking up from all of the surgeries and having the ventilator removed, being able to speak now, and being more aware of what was going on around her, according to police, Bryn acted very confused. She asked the police where she was and how she got there. She also asked where Chad was. Then she asked what happened. She even asked if she was raped and how she was hurt. She claimed to have no memory of anything that happened. Bryn stayed in the hospital for a total of four days before she was able to be released. The same day that she was released, by May 31st, she was arrested on charges of Chad's murder. It was also at that time that Bryn was taken in for an official interview and she was able to give more solid answers about that night. Like I said before, she went to his apartment and they were hanging out, watching TV at around 10 or 10.30 p.m. She said that around that time, Chad went outside to smoke some weed and she went out too, saying that she would like to try it as well. Again, she didn't feel anything at first, but after she took that second hit, she had a very strong negative reaction. She felt like she couldn't breathe, she felt sick, and she suddenly started getting visions, blaming Chad for what happened and telling her to kill him. She said that the visions kept telling her to keep fighting and that she would come back to life if she did. But by the time police got there, the voices transitioned to telling her to hurt herself instead. 
that is when she started stabbing herself. She was claiming that she was in a state of marijuana-induced psychosis when the killing took place. She said that she had no control over her actions and that she did not mean for this to happen. After being released from the hospital by May 31st, like I said, Bryn was charged with murder and she pled not guilty. That is how the case remained and how she was set to be tried. She had her preliminary hearing and was granted a $510,000 bail, which she posted, so she was released while awaiting trial. For the five years that followed, police continued with their investigation into what happened, what caused this, and why this entire thing happened. As we know, this case took place in 2018, and by 2020, COVID happened, and that delayed pretty much everything, especially in the court system. So, five years after his death, the trial for Chad's murder was finally scheduled for October 23rd, 2023. But just about one month before the trial was set to take place, by September 27th, after a new DA took office, the new district attorney reduced the charges against Bryn. Now, she was being charged with involuntary manslaughter, which she still pleaded not guilty to. Which to me is baffling, and if I'm being honest, it feels really heartless. Involuntary manslaughter is defined as an unintentional killing of another person through reckless behavior or in the commission of another crime, but without the intention to kill. Bryn stabbed Chad over 100 times. That is not disputed in this case. The only thing being disputed in this case was the intention or lack thereof behind the stabbings, whether or not Bryn did this on purpose or whether she did this because she was intoxicated and then whether she chose to be intoxicated or not. We are not arguing if she killed him. We are arguing why. Bryn literally couldn't even accept responsibility for killing Chad involuntarily, which is exactly what she claimed happened. She ended his life. There is no question about that. So honestly, I find it very selfish that she couldn't just plead guilty to that. In my opinion, I think she probably thought she could have gotten off scot-free on the arguments that we will discuss in just a minute. But who knows, I think the fact that she forced his family to sit through a trial to prove that she unintentionally killed him is just beyond me. Also, the fact that these charges were dropped so significantly really upset Chad's family and especially Sean, his father, who has been the most outspoken about this case. He was told by prosecutors that they had an ethical issue with charging poor Bryn with the murder. To that, Sean said, quote, it would appear to any reasonable human that the ethical issue is the butchering of an innocent human being and the taking of a human life. He asked that the charges be brought back up to murder, or at the very least, he asked that the charge of murder be left on the table for the jury to decide. At the very least, he asked that the people of Ventura County be allowed to decide. If they choose the lesser sentence after hearing the evidence, then so be it. They are the ones who are living in a community that could be at risk by the light sentencing of this violent offender. So, it should be up to them to decide. However, the prosecution said that the DA's expert mental health professional concluded that Bryn was experiencing a cannabis-induced psychosis. So, while killing Chad, she was apparently unconscious. They said that the defense's expert came to the same conclusion. So based on that, they lowered the charges, saying that there was no longer evidence to support the charge of murder. She did not act with malice. She acted with negligence, which fits these new charges. I'm here because on the 14th of this month, our family was completely ambushed by the Ventura County DA's office. So I think the tough part about and was stabbed 108 times. Five and a half years later, they wanted to try this case for involuntary manslaughter. On May 28, 2018, 26-year-old Chad Amelia was murdered by a woman he had met less than a month before. There was an eyewitness to the crime. Well, the roommate, Chad cried out to him and he said, Vinny, he goes, I need you to call the police. I've been stabbed and get out of the condominium. So... You know, he's getting stabbed and he's worried about his roommate. Get out of here, you know? 
Speecher had also stabbed her support dog. Deputies with the Ventura County Sheriff's Office testified that Speecher turned one of the knives on herself when they arrived. Speecher was tased twice and received a broken wrist and arm when deputies used a baton to disarm her. She was in some form of hallucination. But if you go through, you know, the different types of consciousness, that's one of them. She was not unconscious. She knew what she was doing, and she was actually making choices. She acted with intent to kill somebody, in line with what the original DA, Greg Toten of Ventura County, filed his charges for. It's also in line with what the original deputy DA, Catherine Volker, discussed with our family and expressed to our family. We as a family feel like we're completely ambushed by these people. You know, I mean, I've never seen a group of people try to fight the opposition's fight as much as they did. We're in a place now that Audrey Nofsinger, the deputy DA that's handling the case, she's gonna, by, by the action that she's taking, she's actually acquitting her of second degree murder with no trial. Every time we've gone to court, they've asked for a continuance, every time, every time. We want 60 more days, 60 more days, 60 more days. If, if you just do the simple math on it, divide five and a half years by 60 days, it'll tell you how many continuances they've asked for. After more than five years of waiting, Chad's murder case is finally being brought before a jury on Wednesday, what should have been his 32nd birthday. And let the people of Ventura County hear the evidence and make a decision, you know? And at least at that point, they're giving Chad a chance, they're giving our family a chance, they're giving his friends a chance. And, you know, the community, the people here in the community that, that actually know him. Right now, they're not giving us a chance. Just prosecute the crime for what it is. It's a murder. Nobody's, nobody's ever argued on the defense side that she didn't take a human life. So, the trial for involuntary manslaughter began on November 9th, 2023. For the trial, the argument wasn't whether there was intent behind the murder. It was pretty much agreed that Bryn experienced a drug-induced psychosis. Under California law, people are responsible for their actions when they are impaired by drugs or alcohol that they voluntarily consume. They are not responsible for their actions if the intoxication is involuntary, like say someone spiked your drink. In her trial, the jury was told that involuntary intoxication could mean that she took a drug unknowingly or that she took it due to fraud, force, duress, or trickery. So, someone forcing you to take a drug by threat or giving you something that they said is one thing but is actually something else, like maybe giving you weed that is spiked with fentanyl or something like that. The prosecution portrayed Bryn as a cold-blooded narcissist who chose to get high on the night of the murder. They pointed to text messages between her and her friends where she would talk about drinking alcohol and getting drunk and even missing work one morning due to a hangover. There were other texts where she talked about consuming cannabis. The prosecution said, quote, This is a young woman who lives a lifestyle of getting drunk, passing out, missing work, and her decision to become intoxicated on May 28th resulted in the vicious and violent death of Chad Omelia. They also said that based on her blood test, there was no evidence that there was anything else in that bong besides weed. He didn't spike it, he didn't put anything else in it or mislead her on what she was consuming. They said that Bryn is a strong, professional, responsible woman who made the decision to become intoxicated. She was not coerced by Chad in any way. However, the defense argued that Bryn was a responsible, straight-edge young woman who never partook in partying or drinking or doing drugs. Friends of Bryn's confirmed this, saying that they never knew her to be a big party-goer or drug user. She had absolutely no criminal history, nothing in her past that could indicate any violent behaviors or frequent drug use. The defense said that she was curious about smoking that night, so she took the one hit. They said that after taking the first hit and feeling nothing, however, Chad forced her to take that second hit. They said that she felt intimidated by Chad, even though he did not physically threaten or physically coerce her into taking that hit. 
They said that there was no way that she could have known that the weed would cause a psychotic reaction because in the few times that she had tried it, she only got mildly high and didn't feel much. The defense argued that the aspect of being tricked into smoking could also apply to this case because she had no idea what exactly Chad had put in front of her. She had no idea if it was just weed or if it really was something else. The courts heard that just a week before the stabbing, Chad ordered weed from an unlicensed medical marijuana delivery service. It was a strain called OG Kush with a THC content of 31.8%. That is on the very high end of THC content for the average potencies of THC in any given strain of marijuana. According to the now defunct delivery service, this strain of weed was meant for high tolerance users only. So they said that Chad knew the contents of this bong while Bryn did not. They were sticking to the argument that Chad pressured her into doing another hit. Now, in my opinion, I don't think this argument is fair, saying that he knew that it was a higher percent THC and that he was giving this to Bryn with her having no idea what was actually in it. That's like saying I offered my friend, like, let's say a shot of vodka and they have it in front of them and they're like, how can I be sure that this is actually vodka and you're not actually trying to poison me? There's no way that I could know that this is what you say it is. Like, there's no reason to question what someone is putting in front of you unless there is something else in it. So the defense saying that she didn't know it was just weed, even though Chad was telling her and it was just weed, there was a chance that it could have been something else and there's no way that Bryn could have known. If Bryn was worried about it being anything other than what Chad was telling her it was, she should not have taken any of it. Also, it is her own responsibility to decide whether or not she's going to smoke. We don't know if Chad told her that it was a higher percent THC and she was just like, I'm sure it's fine. We don't know what the conversations were. We don't know what Chad told her because again, Bryn doesn't remember a lot of what happened. So maybe he did tell her, maybe he didn't. I don't think it really makes that much of a difference when you are choosing to smoke. You're not going to ask someone, hey, what percent THC is this? Maybe you should, maybe that is a good question to ask, but most people simply aren't going to. Now, during this whole thing, Bryn's parents were very supportive of her and felt that she was not a murderer. Bryn's parents say that she never actually had any romantic interest in Chad, dispelling the multitude of reports that say that the two were romantically involved. Her parents suggested that maybe he actually tried forcing himself on her and he tried attacking her. They even went as far as saying that what she did might have been a good thing and that maybe she prevented Chad from hurting other women. However, Sean, Chad's father, immediately hit back at those accusations. He said that Chad has never done anything to hurt another person in his life. He has never been accused of pressuring or coercing anyone into anything. And with how long this case took to get to trial and how publicized it was, you would think that if Chad had this history of this behavior, that someone would have come out of the woodworks to talk about it. I think that it's just crazy that Bryn's parents can sit there and say, Look at her past behaviors. She's never had any violent tendencies or drug behavior, so she definitely isn't guilty. While also saying, well, maybe Chad suddenly decided on this specific night that he would randomly decide that Bryn is the person that he's going to try and force to smoke weed and force himself on when he's never done it to anybody else. His past behaviors don't matter in this, only Bryn's do. It's backwards, and I just think these accusations are ridiculous, no matter how innocent you think Bryn may or may not be. At the end of the trial, the prosecution reiterated that Bryn is a party girl who chose to become intoxicated, and that is what led to Chad's murder. They pointed out how during this entire ordeal, Bryn showed no remorse or sadness for what happened to Chad. The only time she showed tears or emotion was for what was happening to her, which again, I find to be very heartless. I do think it points to her character in general because if you had hurt somebody in this way, most people would feel so, so, so guilty. And a trial, that is when you want to show the most emotion to let the jurors know that you are not this cold-blooded, emotionless person. You want to show that you feel really, really terrible for what happened 
and you regret what happened even if it wasn't your fault. But the defense said that the prosecution's description of Bryn is character assassination and an attempt to dirty up Bryn. They said that she is honest and not violent and that she has devoted her life to helping people in need. After about a week of trial, the jury was sent off for deliberations. They deliberated pretty quickly, just under four hours before they came back with their verdict. The jury found that Bryn Spetcher was guilty for the involuntary manslaughter of Chad O'Malia. When the verdict was read out in one of the only displays of emotion, Bryn dropped her head to the table and sobbed loudly. As of right now, we don't know her sentence, but at the upcoming sentencing hearing, which should take place, I believe, this week at some point in December, the following special allegations will be discussed. Use of a deadly weapon, a knife, serious felony, the defendant has engaged in violent conduct that indicates a serious danger to society, and the defendant was armed with and used a weapon in the commission of the crime. Typically, charges of involuntary manslaughter carry a sentence of up to four years in prison and a fine up to $10,000. As she awaits her sentencing, she will be out on bail. I am so sorry that you're having to not only go through this, the loss of your son, but then also the testimony today. I can't imagine what it's like to be in your shoes. What was that like, listening to Ms. Fetcher and what she had to say in court? Well, I'll tell you this, Ashley. Again, thank you for having me. It's The whole trial has been exhausting for, for me and my family. It's very difficult when, again, when you have heard and read all, heard the evidence, read all the statements, and then the individual who committed the act, committed the crime, wants to take absolutely no responsibility for their actions. Um, it, it was hard. It was very difficult to listen to this. But I will say this. I think her attorneys did her a tremendous disservice by putting her on the stand because there has been an individual that they have portrayed as her, and today what was seen was somebody different. And it wasn't just in her behavior and in what she said. There was a lot of text messages, text messages that came out prior to her even meeting my son that demonstrated uh, a behavior of alcohol use, large consumption. Uh, she had missed some work because of it. The truth kind of rolls out and it has rolled out. Those text messages did also reveal with those people prior to meeting my son, there was some marijuana use, the friends used the marijuana, and then there was a period where she started speaking and was asked about my son and, and she said, well, he was a nice guy, he was easy to be around, he was funny. But then when it came time to talk about the bong loads, um, she claimed to be intimidated by him, and none of this information was in any of her prior statements. It's just stuff that's, you know, she's speaking about today. They've heard that somebody has stabbed somebody 108 times, and today was her opportunity to show the jury that she had some form of remorse for her actions. And it was really clear that in her testimony that everything was about her, me, me, me. I can't count how many times I heard her say me. Now, I realize this is not good for her or her family either. But there is a victim here, and she is not the victim. Again, the fact that she had the nerve to cry out loud while she was being found guilty of such measly charges against her actually makes me so mad. Like, she literally brutally ended the life of somebody she supposedly cared about, and he did not die a fast death. He did not die a painless death. It was slow. It was brutal. And during this, all she can think about was herself. Whether it was voluntary or not, normal people would feel immense amounts of guilt that their actions caused the death of someone else, whether it was an accident or not. Whether Bryn was psychotic when she ended Chad's life or not, the lack of remorse and lack of accountability is disturbing, to say the least. After looking at the details of this case, I personally think that on that night, Bryn wanted to smoke 
as someone who doesn't smoke, I have been in situations where I'm close with someone who is smoking, and especially when that person is a new friendship or relationship, you want to do whatever they're doing. If you're hanging out with someone that you really like for the first couple of times, again, whether it's a friendship or a new relationship, you're going to be more convinced to do what they're doing rather than if you have a best friend that you've been hanging out with or in my situation, I had roommates that smoked all the time. They always asked me if I wanted some. I would say no. We are really close friends, but at that point, I don't feel the need to impress them anymore. Bryn never had a bad experience with weed before. So in my opinion, I think she probably just wanted to go along with what Chad was doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think after the first hit, Maybe she didn't feel anything. Maybe she didn't inhale enough or whatever it was. Maybe she just naturally has a higher tolerance or naturally just doesn't feel as much. So maybe she either asked Chad for another hit or Chad was like, hey, if you don't feel anything, take another hit. He absolutely could have suggested that and she could have taken another hit off of his suggestion, but that doesn't make him responsible for her decision to take another hit. I also think the defense's argument of that second hit being what caused it all and her not choosing to take that second hit is ridiculous because whether she chose to take that second hit or not, she still chose to smoke in the first place. So I don't think that that second hit is really what matters. She admitted that she chose to smoke to begin with. I do also genuinely think that she felt too high and she had a panic attack. I'm someone who has panic attacks from smoking weed. I don't like it. It makes me feel really anxious. I've even had a very similar situation to Bryn when I was with friends. Everyone was smoking, they were newer friends, and I hadn't smoked too much in my life, so I only took a little hit. I told them that I didn't feel anything, and they offered me another hit, which I took. I got way too high, and I didn't feel like myself. I felt like I couldn't breathe, so I absolutely understand that feeling as well. Not everyone reacts to drugs the same way, so I can't say that because I personally didn't hurt anyone that it's not possible. I'm not going to say that. But do you know what happened after I was done with being too high and very, very uncomfortable? I said, oh my god, I should not have taken that second hit. I didn't blame my friends for offering it to me. Even if they pressured me, called me a baby or whatever, at the end of the day, the decision is still mine. And in Bryn's situation, a 32-year-old doctor, it was her decision. In that state of mind, mental health professionals agreed that she was in a state of psychosis. I'm not going to argue that because I am not a mental health professional. However, in another case we covered, the case of Monica McCarrick, where she murdered her two sweet, innocent daughters, it was argued that Monica's use of meth caused her a psychosis, which led to the murders. However, she was convicted of murder because in California, you can't take a drug and say that the drug is responsible for your actions. So to me, whether or not Bryn reacted badly to the weed or not, that does not take away the fact that she brutally and violently ended another human life. I think at the very least, she should have gotten voluntary manslaughter, but with this case, I am very much looking forward to what all of you have to say. Either way, Chad's family is extremely disappointed with the outcome of this case. They have thanked the investigators and the officials who responded to the case, but the end result was nowhere near what they wanted and they don't feel like justice has been served. Four years is nowhere near long enough for the taking of another human life, regardless of how you got there. Imagine going five years thinking that there's a trial for murder about to happen, but literally less than a month before you go to trial, you are informed that the charges have been dropped significantly. I can't even imagine what the family has gone through. And to add to that, back in 2020, Chad's mother actually passed away before she even got the chance to see this case brought to court. Overall, this is a very sad, disturbing case that obviously should have never happened. I think that it is absurd that people can take drugs and just blame their actions on the substances that they are on. This is the first case in a while where that defense has worked and it's very sad. I am disgusted with Bryn's family and anyone else who went out there and threw baseless accusations against a man that was stabbed over a hundred times by Bryn, someone who can't possibly defend himself because he was murdered. I know this is one of those cases where everyone will have differing opinions, so I really want to hear all of you sound off in the comments. Do you agree with the charges or do you think that Bryn should have been charged with murder? 
What do you think of her culpability in all of this? Do you believe it truly was a drug-induced psychosis or do you think she knew what she was doing? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow the link in the description box below and download Love and Pies today. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will also be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also linked down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!